Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As a typical woman, I'm going to reorganize this just a little bit. Uh, it is joy. It is honor. It is a privilege to be here and to uh, speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. And usually I'm a slow learner, and God, I learn by failing. And this is sadly very often where I fail. The last time actually I gave this topic, it was a DLF. And I wish I would have, I wish I would have stopped because I was not well and my soul was drained and crushed. I wish I would have said, well, to be respectful to my talk, I'm gonna go and take a nap. So all of you go and take a nap. I actually went forward and this was a few years ago and I just went through it and it was, I was exhausted. And I kind of feel that I'm, a hundred years old and exhausted from life and everything that life has brought. I'm, let me just take this off. I'm a wrong kind of a doctor. I'm, I'm a doctor of theology, not, not medical doctor, but maybe the right kind of a doctor. But actually what really gave me my degree is spending hours with a girl that can barely talk. The girl that the world considers invalid Oh, and let me tell you, I argued, is she really that God? I argued if he can help me if he never had a child with autism. I'm good at that. You know, we Serbs are good at that. But let me just give you a little bit more introduction, who I am. Married to an amazing guy who is right now watching Hannah. So for me, I didn't hesitate a whole lot to come here. I wasn't as busy as the previous speaker. So I was like, oh my gosh, Tanzania, I want to go. I wanted to go to Africa 30 years ago. Where were you, Peter Sanders, to invite me? But I had to talk to Jesus, if this is really where I should be. And I have to talk to my husband, who is a full-time pastor and... Taking care of Hannah is 24-7. So for me to be here, he is here too. He is watching my back, watching Hannah. And I, I talked to Jesus and I believe I should have been here. And I should be here and here I am. But I was born and raised in a country. And just to give you a little bit, some of you know Yugoslavia, some of you don't. Now we are like, Serbia is just, you know, cut from every good part of Yugoslavia. No, we don't have an amazing coast, we don't have any islands, we don't have a whole lot of mountains. We just have a lot of food and fun people and we love to dance. As you can see, I love dancing. But I was born and raised in the same city that I got married and had my own kids. I have three kids. Uh, in the same hospital, so in the same building I had my kids. This country changed its name and identity so many times that all four of us were born in a different country. It's the same building. I was born in Yugoslavia. My son, 20 something years later, was born in Yugoslavia that was much smaller. My daughter was born in Serbia and Montenegro. Another daughter was just born in Serbia. So that is a country of a lot of turmoil, a country of a lot of brokenness and mess. And of course, yeah, we cause all of that, a lot of that, but it is a country that, I think it was Churchill that said, there's just too much turmoil from the Balkans to take. And it is, it's always constantly something, which is so weird coming to, I've been teaching in Middle East and in Syria counseling, and I love going there because actually I think my story is relevant. I totally get it. We were bombed, we were under attacks, we were... But in the midst of pain and chaos, in 1990, uh, 1992, the Gideons walked in my high school. I never heard a gospel before. And they gave me a New Testament. And that completely changed the core of my being. I mean, it was kind of hard to believe in something that happened 2,000 years ago. And it really sounded like a fairy tale. He can change my life today and bring meaning. I didn't have a problem that I'm a sinner, but that he can do it and he can change it, that was kind of questionable. But I thought, what if my country is completely falling apart? The family that I came from already fell apart. My parents were divorced. Everything was falling apart. So it was 1992 when I said, okay, I'll try this. If you really do exist, I know I'm a sinner. Come into my life and bring me meaning. It was that day, I remember a friend of mine in high school asked me, oh my gosh, are you in love? I'm like, well, I don't know if this is love. But 
it changed the core of my being. Three months later, I wanted to be a missionary, and I never left my own country. I married a missionary, and he, he didn't fall in love with me. He fell in love with Serbia, got stuck with me. But we are in Serbia now for 32 years. I never went anywhere. I really thought I would go to Africa, but I didn't. Here I am. But anyways, that is actually when my true identity, the core of who I am and what I was created, I embraced that. I asked him to come into my life. He brought meaning. He brought identity. Tomorrow is not affected by our DNA, but who we are in Jesus Christ. Sadly, there will be moments when I would forget who do I belong to and who is my father. In a village where my mom is from, and uh, when you, it's a small village on a border to Romania, but every time you walk, the people will ask you, these elderly people will sit on, you know, in, in front of their houses and they will ask you, who do, whom do you belong? Who are you? And then you mention your grandparents. Whom do you belong? Who is your father? And it was sadly a lot of, a lot of brokenness and shatteredness in my life that reminded me, whom do I belong? I do have a PowerPoint and I better keep going. So I had to be reminded over and over about my soul, what is good for my soul, because I came broken so many times and I forgot who I am. It's not working. No, it is working. So I'm going to be talking about soul. And when I talk about soul, it is actually care for souls. It is from a Latin word, curanimarum. And that is supporting and restoring. Care is supporting the well-being of something or someone. And cure is actions designed to restore the well-being. Well, church was in a business of this. Not psychologists. This was our, as a believers, this is what we did. And as the previous speaker, as Dr. Woody talked about, Woody, I, I'm not pronouncing this right probably, but as he talked about, it is really, if you lose your soul by doing good, what have we done? You guys are doing amazing good. But we are not called to do good. <laughs> We are called to be his and proclaim his name and give him glory. So in all of this, how, and I actually, as a counselor, as a therapist, when the people come to me, and in Serbia, there's still stigma. Like, why would I go to a counselor? Why would a Christian go to a counselor? Isn't the Bible sufficient? Isn't Bible enough? And I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I know that when some people in the Bible did struggle with depression and sadness and darkness, yes, God is enough. God is and he should be our enough, but he has given us so much more. So why would somebody come? And, and I, I remind them of just simple, simple calling that he told us. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your body. And let me, let me ask you, how does your heart, your mind, and your soul love? If you never ask those questions, how do you love him with every part of your being? Love others as yourselves. Do you love and respect every core of your being? Then how are you obedient to this calling that he's asking us to do? And when I talk about soul, it is, and I'm going to really quickly go through this because it's, it's really mystery what the soul is and there were people always saying, but it's interesting, the SOS stands for Save Our Souls. Um, a Yale psychiatrist and minister, Jeffrey Boyd, said that most people in church adopt the view that, that Loney Tunes theory of the soul. When we die, there's just part of us that is going to go and then there's that theory of 21 grams and that inspired a movie, but... Some of you know how it happened. I'm not going to go there. This is also interesting that once they actually even tried to calculate how much money it cost to save a soul. So this was in 1911. And you can see, well, in Boston was really expensive to actually share the gospel with someone. But then Methodist said that there was $3 to invest in someone to actually in time to share the gospel. But 
When I talk about soul, I'm going to be using the definition that Dallas Willard said. Your soul is what integrates your will, your intentions, your mind, your thoughts and feelings, your values and conscience, and your body, your face, body, language, and actions. And why am I actually talking about on this topic? Because honestly, if your soul is not restful soul, if your soul is not well, it is really hard to have empathy, understanding, and growth. If we are not well, what I tell very often to the parents that have kids with special needs, the most important thing for your child is that you're well, that you're okay. The most important thing for your patient is you being well. And I would even go further, as theologian, the most important thing is you to bring Jesus in you. And I'm going to mention that. We are created in his image. And, and a lot of speakers have mentioned this. This is so important. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And you remember the story, go to the potter's house and look what the potter is making in Jeremiah. I sometimes think and pray of me as a pot, and God use me and shape me the way you want for your glory and your purpose. Many people have spoke and said what that means, Imago Dei, being created in God's own image. It is so important, and I think before we go deep into what we're going to talk about, um, it, is so, it is the core of who you are. How do you perceive yourself and somebody sitting across from you? If they are the image of living God, you would want sometimes even to take your shoes off, especially if they're sharing their brokenness. Because in brokenness, the people meet Jesus. Who is the person sitting across from you? And who do you think that is? The way you perceive the image of God and the person sitting, is Hannah less a person? Is Hannah less my daughter because she has autism? God has taught me so much through this child. I am not a better parent than God is. And I love Hannah just because she is. Do you hear me? She can just be. She is never going to get married. She's never going to bring a diploma. She's never going to be a doctor. She's, she, she can barely speak. <laughs> can she read and write? I don't know. I don't think so. Do I love her less? No. I love her because she is. You don't have to be a doctor for Jesus to die and spill his blood. He died for you, for who you are. The core of your being. Tomorrow, if you can think less, concentrate less. Tomorrow, if dementia comes. Tomorrow, if a drunk driver hits you, he doesn't love you any less. And to bring Jesus to someone, it is amazing if you have great IQ. But is, that is not what he's asking from us. He is telling us. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and then the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. Every human being. Amen? In Serbia, we don't say amen during the... And I'm trying not to preach here, but amen. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in me. Just re recently, starting to read from the beginning of the Bible, I kind of get stuck into the details that God is giving Moses, how he's going to how he's gonna build... How he's going to build the... Oh, how do you call that now? What? Tabernacle. Thank you. It's a tent. A big tent, a fancy tent. And he's going into details, the clasp and the curtains, you know, and I love to decorate. But it's like he's going into so many details that I'm thinking, how is that important and relevant to me? At the same time, I was going to regular checkup and I got my the blood work, you know, and it's sitting there and I understand something. I don't, I don't understand most of it. I'm like, ho hopefully, you know, I'm, it doesn't, it's not bolded mostly, so I'm pretty good. I'm fine. I'm going to live. That's okay. But 
I'm asking God, why is the details of the temple so important? God says, because Helena, you are important to me. Every blood cell in me, everything in my blood work, it's important to God. That is important more than the clasp of the curtains of the tabernacle. That's how important every person is and we are to him. Oh, this is going to be hard to read, but I love what Francis Schaeffer said. How we are glorious, but we are also, he calls us the glorious ruins, a great philosopher. That we are glorious because we were created by God for the noble purposes of being his image barriers. Yet we are ruins because of sin has affected us and ruined us. But we are glorious ruins. What happens when we neglect this temple? First, it belongs to him, and it's his, and it's our responsibility to take care of the temple. We are sensitive. What do we do, actually? To, actually, that's what I mentioned. Signs of neglected temple. Very little things irritate us. We're not patient. We're working hard. We're numb to the emotions. Emotions take energy, and if you don't feel anything, if you're numb, and even the happy emotions take energy, but when we're exhausted, we're numb. I mean, it can take us to some sad ways and paths, to compulsion, to abuse, to addiction. We get disconnected from identity and calling. I love the commercial. It's, I think it's Snickers commercials. Uh, I'm not myself when I'm hungry. It took me years to realize this. If I work all day, if I'm very exhausted, when I come home, and if I have not eaten that day, it's just a simple thing. I just needed something to put in my mouth, and I didn't. And it's the commercial shows that he's, I don't know, crazy or animal. I'm not myself when I'm hungry. I mean, of course, they're advertising a Snicker bar. But... We are not ourselves even when we don't feed physically our body. Well, you've seen you are in a business of neglected body. When the people neglect part of themselves or don't take care of themselves, you know how go bad that goes. What happens when we neglect our soul? How does your quiet time look like? And I have to tell you, I... We've been, my husband and I, we've been church planters. So we were going through church, to Serbia, planting churches. I thought we were doing really well. And I thought we were pretty good. But actually, you know, when Hannah happened, it just shocked me because we didn't know what to do with this girl. And I remember actually coming to God and saying, I think you made a mistake. Hannah's our third daughter, third child. Third, uh, and I remember saying, I think you gave a wrong person this child. I don't think I can be Hannah's mom. And I really believe God told me, Elena, you cannot even be a mom to Benjamin and Sarah. You never came to me. I am here to help you. I've been wanting to help you with those two. <laughs> but it's, I remember having quiet time. And I used to have quiet time thinking it's good for me to have quiet time. I have now time with God, time with my father. Because I can't be Hannah's mom. I can't. Sometimes I can't be married to Greg. Well, certainly he can sometimes be married to me. Sometimes Ephesians, and I'm seriously Ephesians 5, you had to read. It is so hard because he's sometimes not worthy of respect, and I'm not worthy of love with our actions, though. But it's not because of my worthy. It's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus that I respect and love my husband. It is because what he has done for me, I can't wait to spend time with him and in his presence. Somebody was already talking, and yesterday actually we talked, the enemy of the soul and idols. And I know that sin and lie, lie is a sin, but that admission again, because I think it's a, there are little lies that we hear that, that the enemy is telling us, and we don't recognize them. We are so familiar with them. What is the enemy, enemy talk, telling you? And the saddest thing, I think the saddest passages in the Bible are in Jude, and actually uh, it mentions uh, 
before in the Old Testament too, when we start to shepherd ourselves. When we shepherd ourselves, we are the trees that are never going to bear fruit. We are the clouds that are never going to bring rain. That is so sad. And I'm not just talking about pastors. When you start, when everything is about you, being a doctor is about you, then it's a sad thing. And I mentioned here in Exodus, there is a story, recently reading the story in Exodus, how he told the Israels in Exodus that they should take the gold and ask Egyptians for gold. Well, later on, they're going to use that gold, and you know the story, to, to build a calf. And later on, he's going to tell them, they're going to again, put, they're going to be, I mean, building the calf, they're going to end up drinking that gold and being sick from that gold. But later on, he's going to even tell them, just take your gold off. And I'm thinking, why did you tell them in the first place to take the gold? If they're going to use it for the bad purposes. And then, I really, and I started asking God, when did I use something that you gave me for a wrong purpose? What is an idol in your life? Sometimes, children, ministry, church, calling can be the gold. He gave us as a blessing. The only blessing that doesn't have expiration date is Jesus. Everything else dries out. And praise God for it. Because we have a tendency to worship a lot of things. What is the goal that he has given you? What is the blessing that he has given in your life and you recognize it as a blessing? But now the thought of you living without that, it's terrifying. Very often, I think my favorite topic is pain and suffering because I have seen God do miracles in pain and suffering. And I asked him more over and over why there is no, in, not in, discovered induced coma for pain and suffering. Why can somebody who goes through a horrible tragedy, why can we just put him in induced coma and he wakes up and he's all well, he already mourned. Why does the body recovers like that but not the soul? Because when the soul is being shattered and broken, it is the moment you're going to meet him and you remember and be awake. That is the best time of my life is when I was not just on my knees, I was on my face. What is that you're so connected to and it's not Jesus and I hope he's going to take it away because it's not good for you or for that person. Idolatry of the soul is the sin of the soul meeting in needs with anything that distance it from God. In a moment, I have put something on a pedestal higher than God. That something is my God. Who is your God? Oh, gee, I have only 10 minutes to tell you what you should do. I was, this was all bad news. But... <laughs> We have, this is actually Martin Seligman said, a very um, well-known among psychologists in, on positive psychology. He spoke, he's not a believer. And this is what he said. We have replaced church, faith, and community with a tiny little unit that cannot bear the weight of meaning with self. I don't know why that's mentioned twice, but this is me adding more pages every night when I go back to my hotel room. But I've thought of speaking here, and I thought of what it is that every one of you kind of deals with every day. When the people go to a doctor, so this is from a very, just somebody who's going to a doctor as an observant, you first have to recognize the need. Then you need to show trust. Then you need to be vulnerable. Take your clothes off, take your shirt off. It is not an easy, it is a very vulnerable moment. I have to see that I need to see a doctor, the need, I have to trust the doctor. I have to take my clothes off. And I have to be open for the advice they're going to give me. And I have to be open for change. Are you willing to do this and go to God like this? Is every one of us willing to, are we recognizing the need that we need to spend time with him? If you need, I don't know, I mean, a lot of doctors complain that what, they give you 10 to 15 minutes to see a patient, at least I complain, why 10 to 15 minutes? And why when I pay, actually they give me 45 minutes or 30 minutes, but that's another story. So, is 15 really enough? I mean, sometimes it is, 
But is it enough? How much time do you spend with God? Do you trust him? Are you open and vulnerable to you strip your soul, every part of you? Are you really open to tell him who you are and what's happening? Are you going to tell him that you're failing? Are you going to tell him who you are? Are you open for a change? And I hope the way the patients come to you, I hope you're going to come to God like that. What can we do? And I don't mind sharing this slides because I'm going to go very quickly through them. But, ah, uh, retreat. Right speech comes out of silence and right silence comes out of speech. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I love that he was willing that in, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, I love that he understood that the price to follow Jesus is high. If it doesn't cost you anything to follow him, I wonder what gospel do you believe in and you proclaim? The cost of our gospel is causing lives of people in the Middle East right now and in every area. Are you willing to step out? Are you willing to protect the dignity of human beings sitting across from you? Are you willing to protect the dignity of the vulnerable, of the invalid of this world? Are you willing to see the ones that nobody's seeing, to hear the ones that nobody's hearing? I love when Jesus said, and it's also very rebuking, when he said, when I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was in jail, you came to visit me. When was the time when the patient came to you and you thought, I think Jesus was visiting me? Have you prayed for the chair where the patient sits? Do you pray for your office, for the door? Who's going to walk in? On, I, I love what the, what the doctor, the previous speaker, was saying that he doesn't need us. I mean, read Act 17. He doesn't need human hands for his work. Why is he using us? He loves us. Why do I make cookies with my 12-year-old daughter when I can do it faster without her? I can do better. I bought everything. I prepared everything. I want to be with her. I want to spend time with her. She's going to think that she did it. But doing God's work, it is really having amazing seats. VIP seats to see God at work. Sometimes using your hands and your eyes. Retreat and meet him. I encourage every one of you to choose fasting. Different things, it could be from food, it can be from computers, it can be from noise. Giving up on everything that comes between ourselves and God. <laughs> when is our soul well? When we hunger and thirst for the Spirit. <laughs> John 4, I love what Jesus tells, what he says, Samaritan woman. If you would only know who you are speaking to, well, let me ask you, do you know who you are speaking to? I love that, and I joke that if, if they, Jesus would have had at least one woman among 12 disciples, he wouldn't have to send all 12 to get food. He could just send her. But he had to send all 12, and he stayed with, he stayed with this woman at the well. But you know who met at the well, what we read in the Old Testament? Who meets at the well? The future husband and wife. We see, it, we see that story many times in the Old Testament. Who's going to find his, his wife at the well? It's interesting. And when they meet, like Jacob is going to meet his wife at the well, for example. But when he meets with her, what is the next thing? She arranged, arranges a meal in her house. And then they, there's arrangement. Where is Jesus in John 4 going to eat? Disciples are going to bring food, but you know where he's going to eat? In Samaria. He is a God that is choosing to go and meet one soul, one broken woman who is looking for a husband who's going to love her. And he is going to meet her. And he is going to go to her people and eat with them. That's who our Jesus is. Do, do not ever underestimate the smallest, the weakest 
person that comes to your office. Maybe Jesus just walked in. He is going to go to Samaria and spend a few days there. What amazing, what amazing God we have. In Psalm 63, one I love when he says, Oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land when there is a water, there's no water. And in, in the midst of the night, I cling to you. That's what it says in Psalm 63. How special. As Johnny Erickson Tata, some of you heard of her, at the age of 16, she broke her neck. She started Johnny and Friends Ministry. She uh, can only move her head. Amazing woman. She calls Jesus the lover of my soul. Is he the lover of your soul? If he's not, your soul has not been loved. Meet the lover of your soul. Springtime for the soul. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry. This is Dallas Willard's word online. Chew the bread of life. Oh my. It is very interesting to me that Jesus is going to reveal that he's a Messiah to the woman in John 4. But also, do you remember the woman that was bleeding for 12 years? One thing that was surprised to me is that Jesus says, who touched me? All the people were touching him. And the disciples said, well, we were all just touching you. It's, it's a crowd. To me, what was a shock? Why is she the only one? They rubbed her shoulder by Messiah that the others didn't. Do we sit in a church? Do we rub our shoulders? Do we walk by Jesus and we don't recognize him and we don't get the power from him? <laughs> it is Pablo Martinez, a great book, great book written. Um, soul care, I think. No, it's not soul care. Well, we'll remember later. Great, great little booklet. The goal of our life and ministry is to fulfill God's will, not to satisfy people demands. Uh, the power of divine community. And I have to, I'm going to really go quickly. John Venier is the one, the founder of Lark Communities. This is what we, we, he said, we are called to not to do not extraordinary things, even though some of you are doing extraordinary things. I mean, seriously, pediatrician, neonatal, I mean, cardiovascular, seriously, very, very extraordinary. But we are not called to do that. He called us, but very ordinary things with an extraordinary love that flows from the heart of God. Everything that you are doing, the Egyptian it's a miracle that the world can copy when you're doing it as a doctor, plainly just as a doctor. But when you are doing with extraordinary love and with the Jesus, it is extraordinary. Whatever you are doing, do you remember all the miracles? There were miracles that Moses performed and Aaron that did, the miracles God told him what to do. And the Pharaoh had the crowd that can do that. They copied, not all, some. I hope you're going to start performing the miracles that only the children of God can perform and do, not the ones that the others can copy. And I don't know where you are. I don't know how you're doing. I don't know what battles you fought. I don't know how exhausted you are. But in the business of giving and serving, I know you know what I'm talking about, and you've been exhausted. I love this painting, and it's Elijah in a desert. And I love when Elijah is exhausted and tired. This is what the angel tells him. Angel didn't tell him here, here not. Angel told him. Get up and eat. Sometimes maybe that's all you need, just to get up and eat. The second time Angel is going to come, and he's going to tell him, get up and eat and walk. It is sometimes very, very simple. I love that in Jeremiah, I love Jeremiah. If you are tired from running a foot race, how will you race against horses? And I think, from what I've heard and listened, I was with, in an advocacy preform group. You guys did a great, great job. You have to run and chase with the horses. They're gonna, they want to change the identity of our children, the core of who we are. They're going to question our beliefs. 
The world is questioning everything. But if you are tired from running a foot race, God has prepared for us, if we trust him, a race against horses that we can only do it with him. Are you willing to do it? And I'm going to skip a few slides because I want to share something at the end. The things that, I'm, that we're talking are very simple. Stand at the crossroad and look for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find the rest for your souls. If we forget everything, just remember, write down Jeremiah 6.16. What are the ancient path? Where do you have to go? How can your soul get restful? And I am going to be our, it is to know who we really are. Our identity doesn't come from our activity or our, our, the titles in front of our names, but from belonging. That we are deeply loved. Yes, we are deeply sinful, but we are redeemed and restored. And please know who your father is. But I'm going to note. This is what I want to share. The lessons from Hannah. Actually, I'll stop. I'll stop somewhere. Okay, here. Um, Hannah is severely autistic. We found out at the age of two that she's not responding the way the other kids did. And it's been my, well, it is still. I'm, I'm not glorifying autism. Autism is a horrible, horrible thing. I'm not glorifying suffering and pain, but it is promised to us, and it is a moment when we can meet Jesus. But preparing for this lecture a few years ago, I was asking God, what do you want me to tell the people? How do you want to take care of their souls? And one thing about Hannah that God reminded me when I complained, and I'm pretty good at that, when I complain, do you really even get it? How does, I mean, your son didn't have autism. And God showed me over and over again that Yelena, are you choosing to be my child with special needs or are you choosing to be the typical child? Are you his typical child, I'm asking you? Because typical children, they grow into independence. They're going to one day go, they're going to leave, and then they're going to need money, and then here and there they're going to ask for advice. But the whole goal is that they're going to be independent, not dependent from you. Are you a typical child of God? Hannah is always going to need us. She's not growing into independence. Oh, it's exhausting. Without Jesus, I don't even know how the people grasp this. Are you his typical child? So when I was asking, what do you want me to share? And what do you want me to tell? At that time, I was alone with Hannah. And Hannah's been constantly coming and asking me, can you, I want to take a shower. Hannah needs help with everything. She can she, Hannah speaks English. That's another story. Not Serbian. Well, she understands Serbian too. But it's another story. But Hannah's been coming to my face. I want a shower. I want a shower. And if you don't know what a persistent is, I mean, if, if there were more kids with autism in the New Testament, Jesus would have used not a widow, but a child with autism, be persistent like they could be. And then she comes back, and I'm trying really to have a quiet time. And come on, I, I want, I'm trying to prepare for something very important. So God, let me concentrate here. Speak to me. Speak to me. And Hannah comes, I want to take a shower. I want to take a shower. I want to take a shower. And I'm like, finally, I gave up. I don't even know how, I was, how persistent I was not to give up right away. But anyways, I thought, okay, Hannah, let's go and take a bath. That's it. So I put the Bible on the side. I'm giving Hannah a bath, and I'm washing Hannah. I have to wash her hair. I have to wash her body. I have to dry her body. I have to make sure that the water is the right temperature. I have to make sure there's no more soap in her hair. I have to brush her hair. I have to help her dress. She can dress, but very inappropriately, very often, not appropriately for the climate outside. So I have to pick the right clothes. I have to pick the right food. She would live on chocolate, probably, and Coke. I have to pick the right food. I have to pick the right clothes. I have to help her, help her with everything, cut her nails, everything. So here I am taking care of Hannah, and I believe God telling me, let me take care of you like that. So it is in John 15 that I was reading that my Bible was open. So this is what he told me, and this is what I'm asking you to trust him and to let him. Let him wash you from sin, from dirt, from mess, from thoughts, 
from binging Netflix or whatever. Let him feed you the right food, not the word world is speaking about. Let him protect you from the enemies that maybe you're not even seeing. Let him dress you and prepare you for a new day. Let him fill your heart with joy. Let him honor you. Let him be in you that you can be who you are completely and totally his, dependent on him. And that way, you're going to bear much fruit for the kingdom, for his glory. Let him be your father. Let's pray. God, help me be more often like Hannah. Help me be completely dependent on a powerful God and who you are. Let me trust you with my body. Let me trust you with my finances, with my family, with my calling. Let me trust you with everything that is already yours. Please be the father that you said and you want to be. Let us be in you, filled with you, connected with you. Forgive us for not doing this more often. Forgive us for not seeing who you are and who is watching our back and whose name we carry. Love us. Restore us. Use us for your honor and your glory. Amen. Thank you.